We're continuing our series on the faces of Jesus that we started on Wednesday at the Ash Wednesday service. And we've asked local artists and uh, any artists actually who wanted to submit some paintings and so I'll be referring to our two paintings for today here in just a moment. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Out of your word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Ghosting is a relatively new term referring to evidently what is a common dating experience these days. Ghosting occurs when a person abruptly cuts off contact with us without warning or explanation as to why. Even when we reach out to the person to find out why, they just continue to ghost us. They don't respond. It's called ghosting because the person that we've had the relationship with suddenly vanishes into thin air like a ghost. And ghosting just doesn't happen in romantic partnerships. It also occurs in friendships, between family members, and sometimes even between business associates. I think that's usually when there's an undue bill to be paid. <laughs> the problem with being ghosted is it leaves us with so many unanswered questions. Was it me? Was it something I did? Is there something wrong with me? We overanalyze and we obsess over every detail. We play back every conversation that we've had with that person, trying to spot our mistakes, or identify warning signs that we may have missed. Our friends tell us it's not us, but it's still hard to let go of. We may even feel ghosted by God when we're going through a difficult season, and it seems as if God just isn't there. It's as if God has abandoned us, has ghosted us. The writer of Psalm 27 experience both confidence in his relationship with God, but also ghosting. In the opening of Psalm 27, which wasn't a part of our reading this morning, the psalmist wrote these words in verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? You can just hear the confidence that he has but then in verses 2 through 6, the psalmist, the psalmist identifies uh, potentially life-threatening situations. And then he begins to imagine God rescuing him. As the reality of the danger sinks in, he questions whether he's been faithful enough for God to come to his defense. He pleads with God then in verses 7 through 9, which began our reading, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. I can hear the desolation as he says, you've always been here for me. And I know how much I need you, but I also know that I haven't been as faithful to you as I could have been. So please don't hold it against me. Don't be angry with me. Don't turn away from me. He's wondering, will God hold his failures against him? And if he does, will God ghost him? We all have times of feeling abandoned by God. An anonymous poster on a mental health forum for Christians wrote these words. Over the last year, many life circumstances have plunged me into a worsening depression. And the worst part of the whole experience is that I also feel abandoned by God. I have prayed for wisdom to understand what is happening and what I'm supposed to do. I've prayed every day for the grace to help me put one foot in front of the other and carry on. I've scoured the scriptures for direction. I have attended church and watched sermons for guidance and inspiration. 
nothing. God promised he would never forsake me, but here I am alone and in spiritual exile. And with that crushing feeling of loneliness comes an empty internal void that has numbed me to the point of giving up on God. I got nothing. I need something, anything to believe in and give me hope. So what do we do when we feel abandoned by God? I've got four things that I want to share with you this morning. First, when we find ourselves distant from God, it's vital to inventory our feelings to increase our awareness of what all's going on internally. By labeling our emotions, we identify all of the different emotions that are taking place and zero in on those that could be the source of feeling abandoned. I know for me, sometimes when I feel abandoned, it stems more from the shame that I'm feeling over something that I've done or something that I didn't do that I know God would have had me acted differently. God hasn't abandoned me, but it's more like I've abandoned him because I'm embarrassed by my feelings and I just don't want to have to deal with that shame. When we do something wrong, it's appropriate to feel guilt because guilt signals a healthy sense of right and wrong. Shame, on the other hand, falsely implies not that we've done something wrong, but that there's something wrong with us. God is not the author of shame. God will never shame you. Hear that. God is not the author of shame. It's the evil one who uses shame to distract us and to pull us away from God. So, 1 John says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Don't believe every thought, every sense, every emotion that you have. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many, pro many false prophets have gone out into the world. Feelings are not facts. Feelings are powerful, but they're not a reliable indicator of what is really going on around us. Just because we feel something doesn't make it true. That's why it's essential to examine our emotions to see if we're truly responding to a situation or maybe we're overreacting to a feeling-induced perception of the situation. I mean, think about it. How many times have you been mad at someone because of something they said only to find out later that they didn't mean what you thought they said? So we need to check in with reality. The psalmist speculates how sometimes even things in our past can contribute to our feeling of abandonment. He says, if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Now, none of us had perfect parents. Our parents couldn't always be there for us. They couldn't meet our every need, even though they may have wanted to. And so he's saying, maybe the feeling of abandonment that I feel is more because I'm looking at God as an earthly parent rather than as a heavenly parent who can be there for me even though I may not feel God's presence. Our past experiences can jade the present so we should step back and examine feelings for clues about what they can tell us about why we're feeling abandoned. The second thing that I want to share with you this morning is that go back to doing what we did when we last felt God's presence. There are seasons in my life when my faith is hitting on all cylinders and I feel like I'm in close communion with God. But there are other times when I'm operating on cruise control. Not that I'm ignoring God, but it's just that I'm not actively listening for God's will or God's direction in my life. And then there are those painful times when I'm completely out of touch with God and struggling to connect. In those times, I know I need to go back to the habits and practices 
that have sustained me in the past and helped me to feel God's presence in my life. The psalmist knew that he needed time with God in order to feel connected. So he says, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. He recalled when he previously felt more assured of God's presence, he was actively seeking God's direction. And certainly in times of stress, we all need to be active in pursuing God, more so than in times when things are going well. When I spend a minimum of 20 minutes each morning in my practice of contemplative prayer, that's a practice where I actively listen for God in silence, then what I know is that throughout the remainder of the day, I'm more in touch with when God is sending me signals or letting me know through the prompting of the Holy Spirit that there's something that I need to pay attention to. So if I feel distant from God, I know that often what I need to do is I need to go back and check and see, have I been faithful in my practice of contemplative prayer? And if I haven't, then I know my first step toward getting back on track, and that is to refocus my effort and my energy in that time of silence, being in the presence of God. The third thing is don't focus on the problem. Focus on the problem solved. Now, this may be obvious to a lot of you, but evidently I'm a slow learner because I can get mired and stuck in a problem just thinking through all the intricacies of the problem. If I can shift my perspective, though, and imagine my life with the problem solved, it releases me to find solutions. In verses 12 and 13, the psalmist practices this visioning when he says, Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. He's feeling the stress and the anxiety. His enemies are out to get him, he says. But then he makes a shift. He says, I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And the reference to the land of the living means he knows he's not going to die. That God's got this and he's going to see God's goodness. He, he was focusing on the problem at first. Oh, my enemies are out to get me. But then he remembered that the trajectory of his life had a different arc. And so he was able then to see God's goodness in the future and his anxiety disappeared. So when we feel abandoned by God, instead of focusing on the silence, keep looking for God's presence. My last point this morning is to practice patience with yourself and with God. Unfortunately, even if we're able to do the previous three things of getting in touch with our feelings, re-engaging the practices that generally make us aware of God's presence, and focusing on the problem solved. Even though we may be able to do those three things, we can still feel as if God has ghosted us. And that's when patience is required. The psalmist says this, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 27, 14, what I just read for you, inspired Ann Davis's depiction of the face of Jesus, and that's this one here. I meditated on her painting throughout the week as I thought about this message today in hopes of being able to see Jesus through her eyes. And these are the words that she wrote. Painting the face of Jesus was a reminder of my faith journey, a blank canvas progressing through layers of shapes and colors, a face I didn't understand, a period where I walked away in frustration only to return and seek the image I know in my heart, an image of love, grace, and shelter. Although there may be flaws in the paintings and my faith, both have come a long way from the blank canvas. 
while I have finished this work, my faith journey is still a work in progress. When you look at that painting, I love the kind and gentle demeanor that Anne reflected in her vision of the face of Jesus. You've heard me say before that if you want to know who God is, look to Jesus, because Jesus is the perfect representation of God. And I believe Anne has given us an accurate picture of the Father. And the inspiration that comes out of Psalm 27, 14 is really a path for our continued growth. Wait, be strong, take courage, wait. So at first we wait, trusting that God is still at work, even though we may not feel his presence or understand where or how God is at work. But then our strength comes from remembering God's faithfulness in the past. And taking stock of the resources that we have at hand. And sometimes those resources are the people around us that we need to share our struggle with so that they can help us on this journey. Our courage comes from the hope that we will be okay no matter what. And then we have to wait some more. It's not easy. I'm not saying it ever is easy to wait. But it's the only way through a time of desolation if we want to recover a sense of God's presence. I also meditated on Jeannie Chenault's watercolor and ink painting, The Joyous Embrace. She wrote these words. I painted this watercolor of my brother Billy a few days following his death in 2018. I felt many emotions then, extreme loss, joy, and relief that he is free of suffering and pain, and the assurance he is at peace in the arms of Jesus in heaven. I can only imagine, she wrote, echoing the words of that Mercy Me song, the imagining of what is not yet leads to hope, imagining the problem solved. Jeannie finds hope expressed in waiting and in the words of Isaiah 40, verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God will never forsake you. The hope that we have is imagining what our lives will be like when our problem of sin is solved and we're in joyous communion with God. And that's what is offered here at this table, is a physical reminder of God's love for each and every one of us. And that's why it's available to anybody, because God's unconditional love, it's for you. Don't imagine it just for someone else, but imagine it for you. And as we rehearse, as we practice the discipline, the story of our salvation and the telling of the communion story, may you find hope, even if God doesn't feel close right now. May you find hope that he will be there no matter what.